masturbate The government knows when you're whacking it The government knows when you feel alone And scared away And you're sitting at home They fill the sky Full of drones To check on you And your voting Size don't matter to the CIA They can see your dick from outer space The only way to spare more pain and more loss, the only way these millstones no longer mark our national mourning, these milestones, I should say, no, no longer mo mark our national mourning. So, leave us alone, you centralizers of power, you worshipers of Gaia, you sacrificers of the wealth and property of others, you would-be planetary saviors, you Machiavellian pretenders and virtue signalers, objecting to power, all the while you gathered around you madly. Leave us alone. Two officers had just questioned a teenager about why he wasn't wearing a mask during Victoria's COVID restrictions last year. Get back now or you'll be tired. You'll be tired. Get back. Put that down now or you'll be safe. Constable Ringin managed to wrestle the bat from Cleary's hands. The 21-year-old officer retaliating with force. The senior constable telling a judge he would have died if his partner hadn't stepped in. I am convinced that without his intervention, I would have been beaten to death. One of the things you've been talking about on your show is your allegation that government officials are aiding in pedophilia, <coughs> child trafficking, and the grooming of children, right? Well, you mean like what Jeffrey Epstein did with the Clintons? Ah! But you can't use a gun for self-protection in mm -hmm. Canada. That's not a right that you have in the Constitution or anywhere else. If you try and buy a gun and say it's for self-protection, no, you don't get that. You get it for hunting. You can get it for sports shooting. You can take it to the range. Uh, no problem, as long as you go through our rigorous background checks. To the person who is about to grab their car keys and go to the ATM and take out $3,000, you say what? You don't need to. Your ATM is safe. Your banks are safe. There's enough cash in the financial system, and there is an infinite amount of cash at the Federal Reserve. An infinite, an infinite, an infinite. There's an infinite amount of cash at the Federal Reserve. <laughs> man is accused of inappropriately touching a 12-year-old girl at the Walmart in West Mifflin Sunday afternoon. There's even been word in a new study that actually 100% of ATF agents have wives that have boyfriends. And this is consistent with previous dad advice. So we yeah, take that into account. What makes you comfortable with a world where people can pump out guns in their garage anytime they want to? What's going to make me comfortable is when people stop coming to this office and, and acting like there's a debate about it. The debate is over. The guns are downloadable. The files are in the public domain. You cannot take them back. You can adjust your politics to this reality. You will not ask me to adjust mine. Well, there it is. The world has now been exposed to anarcho-capitalism in the biggest way yet with the HBO documentary, The Anarchist, that just finished airing its final episode. What do you think? Good? Bad? Awesome? Terrible? Let's hear your thoughts and we'll chat about ours. Let's get into it. From Dallas, Texas, this is Anarchast. Greetings, home box offices. Welcome back to the Anarchast, your home for anarchy on the internet. 
I will be Patrick Smith, and today I have with me very special guest, Larkin Rose. How are you? I'm doing great. Yeehaw. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Yeehaw. All right. So, uh, I don't even know really how to begin on this, man. Um, I have many thoughts. I have many feelings. And, uh, and I've also been sick this past four days, so I'm, I'm grumpy. And so my opinions are probably going to come off maybe more raw than they, than I want them to, uh, that'll help. <laughs> and, and, and also I know that we have, you know, we have, we've got the creators, um, uh, Kim and Todd, uh, probably watching the show right now as we speak. And, and, uh, so I'm, I want to, I want to stay tempered. I want to stay balanced, but I also want to be honest. Uh, and give some good good thoughts and feedback. What about you? Like, do you want to do you want to start? Like, generally, like, what do you think? Sure, because I was actually uh, in the video um, that covers this. And the funny thing is, I had already planned to make that video, and then another thing happened at a different event, which just that I was at that just totally reinforced it. So the video, and I may still make it, the video was going to be called Setting a Bad Example. Um, but I'll start by saying I don't at all fault Kim and Todd for accurately reporting actual events. If And, and when, when people say, oh, this is the HBO thing is making us look bad. Well, if there's an us, we're the ones making us look bad because it was literally reporting of stuff that actually happened among mostly people who call themselves anarchists and to yeah of, of course the show focuses on on drama and stuff because that's what that's like and it is just the fault of the media that the whole if it bleeds it leads thing it's also what people pay attention to and it's what people were talking about like at the event like if there's a murder of somebody in a community that's related to something people are going to talk about that at at the event and afterwards and everywhere else and stuff. So it's, it tells the story like the, the sad thing that happened with John and stuff. Um, and so the, the, my, my objection isn't actually with the show at all, because I thought the show was really well done. It told a true story of a bunch of stuff. And I will say this, I'll, I'll dive on board your grumpiness and add my grumpiness <laughs> Uh oh, for 26 stinking years I've been objecting to the fact that a lot of self-described anarchists have set the worst possible example for what anarchism actually means now the thing is part of the problem a big part of the problem is that most people can't distinguish between a message and the messenger they, they, they can't think in terms of, well, here are the concepts, here are the principles, here are the claims, and that's unrelated to whoever it is who, who said them. They automatically associate the people they're hearing it from with the ideas. Uh, an example I might use is like, you know, if somebody, if they associate Christianity with some slimy TV evangelist crook, they may get the impression, oh, Christianity is horrible. And somebody else may say, oh, my neighbor is like really nice and generous and he's a Christian. He's not at all preachy and he's really kind and stuff. And so they people can get the impression of an idea based on who they associate it with. And the trouble with that is that's not how principles and ideas actually work. Um, but the, the reality, given, <laughs> given that, is that if the movement, I've always hated that term, if the movement puts across a whole bunch of examples of people who are short-sighted and bickering or in one way or another have traits that a lot of people are going to go, well, that's not me, and have that represent anarchism, you're going to scare people away and confuse people. And, and like I love the fact that the HBO thing actually contained, like, snippets of explanation of what anarcho-capitalism actually is that was cool and in the story normal people are still going to watch it and go eh, well well i don't associate with them or i don't associate with them and the thing is people can decide not to associate well i don't associate with the you know coke sniffing promiscuous wit ravers and the others well i don't associate with the the hippies and the, this and that and the other thing who believe in healing crystals and like 
all of that is secondary. And I've always objected, often out loud, to the fact that if you say this is a representation of anarchism, this event is about anarchism, and I don't just mean anarchopolka, I mean lots of things that have gone on, and then you jumble in all sorts of other things, people, normal people already have a hard enough time following even a simple train of logic. And if you jumble it up with a bunch of other stuff, they're going to be confused. And if the movement puts up this front that's this confusing mess with conflicting garbage and a bunch of personalities and dramas that have nothing to do with the principle, you start to get people talking about how, well, you know, I'm not on in favor of people who live that way. And they're anarchists, so I'm not an anarchist. And the clarity of the ideas is, the, the, the beauty of the ideas is, it doesn't matter what else you believe and what else you do and what your preferences are. You can be like the most conservative Christian, blah, 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 as long as you don't believe in a ruling class, or a complete hippie free love type, as long as you don't believe in a ruling class, or a million other things. But when people start to think that, well, you have to be a this and a that and the other thing, they're making it harder and harder and harder and harder and harder for normal people out there to learn what voluntarism actually is. And that's not the fault of Kim and Todd, and it's not the fault of HBO. It's the fault of people who mix up the message because they throw in their pet stuff alongside the message. And there's a ton of stuff that I, I believe and I talk about and I do and I'm interested in that I don't mention in public because it has nothing to do when I'm in the mode of talking about anarchism because it has nothing to do with that. Like, I don't care if people agree with me on that and it's 100% relevant. Like, well, what do you think is the mechanism of evolutionary biology? Well, we can have a fun discussion about that. It has nothing to do with anarchism. Well, what do you think about spiritualism? And this and that, none of those have anything to do with it. And if we don't make that clear division, the people listening and paying attention are certainly not going to be able to make the division. And so watching the, for, and this is one example of many, but watching the spectacle that so many anarchists do, um, and just cringing the whole time because it's already so hard to get the message through. It's just really frustrating. And I've been doing this back when I knew like nobody else who believed it. And it's like, it isn't, it isn't the fault of the people reporting it. It's the fault of the people who call themselves anarchists and manage to be this bad at actually expressing what the thing's about. So that's my intro rant. <laughs> yeah, no, that was good. Um, so a couple, a little house cleaning. The Odyssey feed is not working. There's some technical difficulties with Odyssey. So I apologize to the viewers that went there first. Uh, I Hopefully I posted the link in the comments there and they're finding us here uh, on YouTube. And um, <clears throat> Facebook is also no longer allowing us to stream to our Facebook page. And uh, we just got off of our YouTube ban. So um, I'm lucky that you can even see our faces right now. <laughs> Yeah. Um, yeah, normally I would say, please follow us over on Odyssey, because uh, that's usually where you're going to find us when we get banned from all the other places. Um, but there's some, there's there's a glitch happening today. So here we are on YouTube. Um, OK, so I mean, like everything you said was very valid, but the un the unasked question is, well, should the documentary have been made and or should the documentary have been made named the anarchists? Because, like, par part of my complaint is that, and, and this goes for all of the sort of labels that I associate myself with, right? Libertarian, voluntarist, anarcho-capitalist, anarchist. Every time you have a person out there in the world like, oh, what was that dude? Can't, can't well, can't, can't, can't well. He yeah. called himself an anarcho-capitalist, volunteers, whatever, for years. Right. And then he just went nuts and went far Nazi, whatever. Yeah. And yep. every time that happens, it's just like you said, setting a bad example, dragging these labels that we're trying to elevate in the world through the mud. Um, when when we create a, a documentary, which I think, and you, correct me if you disagree, cert certainly, but I think it's like the, the largest representation that anarcho-capitalism has had in the world to date. And we named it yeah, anarcho-capitalism. And, yeah. and, ep and episode one briefly talked about anarcho-capitalism. And 
very well differentiated it from the Molotov cocktail throwing commies that we talked about last time. It was going great. Mm -hmm. I was I was enjoying that. Uh, and then we told the story of and look, here's part of my problem. And I'm going to be honest because that's who I am. And this might hurt some feelings of people that I know. Like I know Lily. I worked with her with an uh, with uh, an Arcapulco for the past two years. I don't know a lot of the other people involved in this story. Um, but still, I know uh, this is a small circle. Like we know each other, right? And but I don't think they would disagree. These people made a long chain of really terrible decisions in life, and this documentary called itself the anarchists and then followed a series of people that made a bunch of really terrible decisions that led to some really horrible outcomes that were not just, I mean, certainly this was state violence and, and, uh, and cartel violence that should not have happened. And I'm not excusing it. Um, but that doesn't mean the decisions that led to these situations weren't terrible ones or, or at least poor ones. They could have, they could have made better decisions. And so we focused on, a really rough story, a, a tragic story, a, a series of tragic stories yeah. with various people, um, which makes for an excellent documentary. And as far as like the production quality, the videography, the the scoring, the 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 way it told this these tragic stories, amazing. Like they did a yeah. full on triple A professional job. Very well done. It's I, I'm only butt hurt <laughs> about it from that from that um attaching that baggage to um the ideology the name the label anarcho-capitalist the anarchist um was that a good idea could they have just named it something different and still sold the documentary and they and did solve that was problems? The first choice oh see but, so i'm missing context go ahead like what what do i it know it was supposed to be called this um you, and you cut out. What'd you say? What was it supposed to be called? It was originally it was going to be called Stateless, oh, okay. and something else came out that was called Stateless. So they're like, "Well, we can't do that." And then it was <laughs> literally going to be called "Fuck the State," and oh. HBO was going to run it as "Fuck the State" for whatever reason. Somebody, you know, they they settled on the anarchists. I don't know who all like had that decision and who all made that decision. I slightly cringe, but I don't know what else I would have called it because like their goal is to get people to watch. So if you name it some weird, obscure yeah. explanation thing, people go, uh. so I totally understand. But yeah, I have the same. Um, it's not even an objection. I just sort of cringe at the fact that, well, if people think that is the representation of, of anarchism, yeah, that's kind of annoying. Um, but I don't know what else I would have called it if I worked for HBO and was trying to get to people to watch it. Um, but the, so, and I, I completely, I completely understand that. And the thing is I've been, you know, because the people in power try to do the guilt by association thing. Um, and the, uh, there's so many examples. Okay. I'm going to bring it up and you'll get a whole bunch of complaints. Um, I think the flat earth thing really is a psyop to try to make truth seekers look gullible and stupid. <laughs> um, and like the, the inexplicable explosion of it. Um, I think it's designed to do that. Now, whether it's designed to do that or not, it does that. Like I've literally seen people say, Oh, you must be one of those people who think the earth is flat. And every time I cringe and go, even if you think the earth is flat, if you put that in this, if you're talking as if, there shouldn't be a ruling class. By the way, the earth is flat. Like, shut up. Like, even if you believe that, first of all, you suck at science. But second of all, why would you jumble that together knowing full well that a lot of the world is going to go, well, that's ridiculous. Like, are you trying to do the guilt by association with something that already has an uphill battle? Or did you just not notice? And that's the thing is so many people, like, I, I totally consider myself a propagandist. Now, Propaganda usually has a negative connotation. The definition doesn't actually mean you're lying about crap. It means you're trying to be persuasive. But, you know, usually we use it in a, as a derogatory term. But I'm about trying to spread the ideas to as many people as fast as possible. And so there's always the thought of, okay, what does this look like to other people? You know, every everyone in advertising does that too. Well, we want to sell this product. What's this going to look like to people if we produce, you know, 
present it this way. Well, that would be dumb. Everybody's going to associate with that. Let's do it this way. And it seems so many people get caught up in their drama. So many anarchists, because they're people, we're still just people. And we still do the dumb things that people do. Um, and they get so caught up in their drama and disagreements and, and fights and stuff that they don't get that when you're sort of in front of people representing anarchism, which like, I hate the fact that there even is that just because people are bad at thinking, but like, don't make a big jumbled, noisy, confusing mess when you're <laughs> dealing with stuff related to this, How, you know, you can have your confusing mess on the side and I can have 80 million things that I believe on the side that have nothing to do with it. But if, if we want people to learn about this concept, don't muddle it with a billion other things. And it's true that the title anarchist, the anarchists can make people think, oh, I guess this is what anarchists are. And that makes me cringe. And the thing is, I don't think anybody who was just about to be an anarchist is going to watch that and go, well, now I'm going to be a statist. Like, so it's, it's kind of unfortunate, but I don't think it makes anybody go backwards. And if people are going to look into it, they're going to look into it. Most people who watch HBO aren't trying that hard to think about stuff. They're just trying to watch an interesting story anyway, sadly enough. Um, so it's not, you know, it's not my favorite title and it, it wasn't my favorite opening scene with the book burning, even though that was really damn funny. But like, again, what that's going to look like to other people is like, wait, what's going on? And they like, they won't necessarily get the meaning, but that's, that's from the perspective of a propagandist and Todd and get, well, Todd even came out and said, this, this isn't supposed to be propaganda against or for anarchism It's telling a story. Cause he's a filmmaker. His job is to tell the story. And he was living the story. Like he was, he showed up and didn't know the people and didn't know what was going on. So it's, it's sort of a documenting of his experience and learning of what was going on and, and watching it all unfold. So he's not like, it's not as a filmmaker, it's not his job to make whatever we like. Yeah. And if he lied, I'd be <laughs> at his throat and say, don't lie and make stuff up to make us look bad. But he didn't. Like everything in that was true. He was, and, and he let the people say it in their own words. Literally everything that I cringed at was said by anarchists and everything they did that I cringed at was done by people who call themselves anarchists. So I can't blame the people who did it. They didn't make stuff up. Yeah. Yeah. I'm, I'm not blaming, um, uh, Kim and Todd. Um, it, yeah. I mean, maybe except for the title. <laughs> I'm a little butthurt about that, but no, like I, I'm not even sure how much influence they had over that, but fair, but, I don't know. I, fair. I don't know. I, I, I will. I hope they come on the show. Um, and we can maybe have, have them directly respond to some of the comments that people are leaving. Speaking of, um, we are taking your questions. If you want us to address something specific, put it in the comments. Um, maybe type question in all caps so that I make sure and see it. Cause there's a lot of chat going by and I'm trying to focus on chatting with Larkin. So Definitely leave your questions or comments and, and uh, we'll get to them. Um, I also don't think this was like apocalyptic by any means either. Like yeah. they, they told a tragic story about uh, several um, tragedies, um, but in general, like for anarchy, uh, this is not going to be, uh, dude, the entire world always already says the word anarchy every time they mean chaos. So yeah, at worst case, this kind of just adds to that a little bit. I, I mean, I'm not, I'm not super upset about it, but maybe let's talk about yeah. it. Let's talk about some of the cringe moments, some of the things that some of the the people in the show said that made us go, Oh God, did they have to say that? You know, like, <laughs> um, and, and I'll start and, and I'll start. And there was one, um, and a lot of them were in the last episode, actually. Um, mm -hmm. uh, I think it was Nathan at one point after, and look, look, let me back up for a second, just so people know my involvement. Right. So, um, I was a speaker at Anarchapoco for the first time, um, the, the year after all of this happened. So my involvement with the event and getting to know these people, uh, began after this was over. And, uh, so the, the following two years after that was when I started getting involved in Anarchapoco. And, um, then the last two years, now I don't, I don't know about this year, but the last two years I've been involved with the production team of Anarchapoco, helping them put on the event since Catherine took over. So prior to Catherine, 
I didn't have involvement, but I do have a lot of insight into how the, how it, what it's like to produce the event. So um, that's mm. where I'm coming from. And so anything I say is just from that view. Like I don't have any secret inside knowledge or behind the scenes information. Larkin probably knows a lot more than I do because he knows I, I, these people directly. <laughs> yeah. And yeah. so I just wanted to kind of put it out there that that's where I'm coming from. I'm not speaking authoritatively. Okay. Um, so Nathan, whom I've uh, never met face to face for the record, um, was, uh, was the guy that ran an Arcapoco for the first several years. And in the last mm -hmm. episode, he said something like this was after, um, he either got fired or quit. I, I think Jeff says he quit and he says he got fired or whatever. I, I don't know. Wasn't there. Um, but, uh, he said he's watching his ideology like fall apart in front of him. Yeah. And, and repeatedly, this was a theme of the people in this documentary. They kept, they kept taking what was happening to them specifically based on their series of choices and interactions and based on the associations of the people they chose to associate with. And they, and they took that as a direct reflection on anarchy as an ideology and, and liberty and freedom in general. And when, when it didn't go well for them in their life because of these choices and associations that they had and made, oh, well, anarchy is flawed. And I, the last episode, especially from several people, I think we got that impression. And every time I'm like groaning, uh, oh, it's like, oh, why, why do you think this has anything to do with, with, with anarchy? Um, and, and, and this was a, this, this theme came up in a couple other places. Um, like I, I think a cup, uh, three and goes ago, there was some people upset that they weren't able to vend for free at the event. And in the documentary at one point they were like, well, what is this hierarchy at an anarchist event? It's, and I'm like, yes, it's private property. It's a private event. You had to buy tickets to go They're in charge. You know, they get to decide who gets to sell stuff there. It was just like this weird theme of like, man, I'm not sure these people know what they're saying. What do you think? Yeah. Now, uh, in Nathan's defense, I think he would sort of agree that, well, no, it doesn't like it doesn't mean, no, I'm going to be a status because of that. But, yeah, I, I cringed at, at, at the way that was worded, too. Um, and other people worded it more like like mm, okay here here here's my contribution to the the complaining about things i won't say who he is but he he agreed to have his name listed as former anarchist i don't know if you noticed that but that was under his name on the show and he talked about well the drama and things yeah. went wrong and stuff and it's like things went wrong therefore you now advocate the existence of authoritarian ruling class because if you're not an anarchist that's the other choice like anarchist means you oppose the existence of an authoritarian ruling class if you're not that it means you want the existence of a ruling class and to me that was one of the most painful like examples of what you're talking about is oh inconvenient and horrible and sad and dramatic things happened therefore this is a problem with the philosophy it's no, and, and I actually mentioned this in a video I did after like episode three or something. I think I called it like the problem with anarchism. And the problem with anarchism is we're people. Like the problem isn't anarchism, is people are still people. If you remove the ruling class, people can still be stupid and short sighted and damaged and bad at communicating and <laughs> all sorts of stupid things that people have always been. Um, but yeah, I, I had to cringe at the, the number of people who either implied or just kind of outright said, well, this just shows that anarchism doesn't work. And just, no, it doesn't. That's, that's, it's such bad logic. And unfortunately, I think there are a number of anarchists who sort of think that way because they don't even all the way understand it. They just sort of think, yeah, nobody's the boss of me. Bad things, they go wrong and they go, oh, well, maybe somebody needs to be the boss of me. And it's just like, if you, if you got to anarchism by just sort of thinking, well, that sounds cool. Let's see if that works. Like, then you don't understand anything. And if you back away from it because people are people and bad things happen, it tells me you never understood it. And it's also just drastically ironic to me that like, well, there's some drama and there was one murder that, that wasn't committed by an anarchist. It was committed by the drug cartels, which exist because of the U S war on drugs. 
So there's one killing as a result of statism. We're like, well, that's, you know, that's the end. That's the end of this philosophy. Yeah. Meanwhile, how many people every day are killed by the U.S. military around the world? Like, so why aren't we going, well, that's the end of statism. <laughs> <laughs> so, yeah, it's it, it's the muddle-headed thing that I've been complaining about for ages. And unfortunately, there are a bunch of self-described anarchists who are also pretty muddle-headed. And you can see it in their comments. Instead of just, yeah, this drama is annoying and I'm sorry it didn't go well. And and I I really feel for Nathan. I did know him personally. I mean, not mm. super well, but we met a number of times. And he's he's quite the cartoon character. But he he really freaking cared and he really believed in the ideas and he really wanted to forward them, you know, push them forward. And to me, I just, I feel the pain he went through precisely because he's trying to push these great ideas forward by way of a group of people who have all their trauma and damage and stupidity and short-sightedness and all the things that people just have because they're people. Um, and just watching a, you know, one mess after another and and I could like I can point fingers in all directions if I want to about crappy communications. The funny thing is Amanda and I are still friends with people who aren't friends with each other. And even then, a lot of times I go, yeah, but you like I get where you're coming from and the way you conveyed it. I get why that pissed that person off and the way they responded. I get why that pissed you off. And I'm sort of sitting there thinking, oh, do I have to deal with humans <laughs> to, to <laughs> like explain these principles or can i just go hide in a cave and post videos or something because it's annoying as crap um that is an option but, <laughs> i've been doing it a lot lately <laughs> I'm tempted. oh but oh okay so uh, should i throw in the thing that happened while i was already thinking of making this video i was at an event of anarchists mind you I don't even know if you heard about this. And some what brilliant event? anarchists decided to make the decision on pe on behalf of hundreds of people camped at a campground that they should hear at a deafening level crappy music blasted the entire night that could be heard from three miles away so that a whole lot of people couldn't sleep and literally felt tortured. Uh -oh. And hold on. It, was this was this was this our camp at Float Fest? Are you talking about us? Because <laughs> we we played a lot of music. Oh funny. shit! Am I am I getting called on the carpet here? <laughs> no, no. Oh good. It okay. Was, it was way way worse than that. Way way. way like, okay. I may have heard you a couple Whew. times if I was in that way. No, I thought I thought Larkin good. was calling me the hell out right now. It's, oh man! I probably would have mentioned that ahead of time if it was you. No, it's <laughs> just bringing on you on your show <laughs> no and the thing is people pointed out and they're like um you're like you're literally torturing people and kids are crying and they can't sleep and people are like what the hell's going on and the people responsible played the victim and then said well we're gonna turn it up louder and then it was just it was aggression like your music has to be pretty damn loud to count as aggression this was aggression like we we were amanda and i were as far away as you can get and still be in the campground and she got no sleep it was that stinking loud and we drove Holy people crap. drove down the road three miles and you could still hear it and, and this is in the woods with hills and stuff it's not an open place and people said um you can't do this like people didn't come here for this they didn't agree to this you're inflicting this on them and they doubled down and i thought oh the irony I went here to hang out with anarchists and they did literally what the federal government did to the Davidians, cranking music all night, keeping, causing sleep deprivation to torture them intentionally. And now anarchists are doing that to several hundred other anarchists. And I'm thinking, you know, if somebody came to this camp saying, hey, I want to see what anarchism is all about, I would have said, then please turn around and go away. Because this is not what anarchism is about. This is idiots being completely inconsiderate, drugged out of their gourd, terrorizing a bunch of other people, too stupid to notice that to begin with, and too obnoxious to change it when a bunch of people pointed it out and complained. And I was like, you, like, this is, and I actually, I, well, I went down at four in the morning and screamed at the guy. 
Apparently I wasn't the first one, but I was one of the first. And I was like, this is why people think we need government. Because some people are so obnoxious that they think, well, we need an authority to stop them. Hmm. And it's just like, if that's, if that's what anarchists do. Okay, so here's my punchline that'll offend a bunch of people and you freaking deserve it. In a stateless society, I would be much happier surrounded by most of the statists I know than most of the anarchists I know. Let me say that again. In a stateless oh, I have, I'm sorry. No, I got I to gotta kick you off the show now. No, I'm just kidding. <laughs> <laughs> In a stateless society, so there isn't a mechanism by which they can dominate and rob me, I would rather be around a bunch of the statists I know who are responsible and considerate and nice and have a work ethic and like a bunch of good qualities they have a really crappy belief system on top of that which they don't recognize as a really crappy belief system they don't get the inherent immorality of it but as people on a day-to-day basis they're pretty dang nice and i look at a lot of the self-proclaimed anarchists and ones portrayed in the hbo special you know, Paul was a total basket case. And instead of people saying, you're a dangerous, scary nutcase, please go away. They brought him in and kept him around. And, and I was like, you, you're you literally showing to the world, here's a group of people who are way more obnoxious than the general public trying to show you why you should, instead of believing what the general public believes, believe what these way more obnoxious people believe. Now, obviously, that's not all anarchists. It's not even most anarchists, but it is the ones who tend to get the most attention because people who cause problems are the ones you notice. Um, and because there's lots of awesome actual voluntarists I know that I'd love to live around. But there's, there's so much conflict and tension and stupidity that comes from self-described anarchists and then people complain that, oh, this is making us look bad. Yeah, w- why aren't you complaining at the people making us look bad instead of at the people reporting it? Or at the, the people who look at it and go, hey, that looks bad. This brings up two, yeah. two really important topics that was already on my list to talk about. Um, number one is curating the people in your orbits. Like, yeah, you have to make sure that you associate with the best people that you can, not only for your own reputation, but because it lowers the level of drama in your life. It lowers the level, the level of all the bad stuff in your life, uh, fraud and deceit and even violent people. If you have a bad gut feeling about somebody disassociate from them. And that goes for the movement as well. Don't stick around people to be like, what, what's the word I'm looking for? It's, um, pathologically altruistic. Like you want to help people that are in a bad place. And this is an example straight from some people in the documentary, right? You had this, this veteran that was clearly damaged. He had PTSD. I didn't know him for the record. Never met him. I'm just giving my outside opinion. So if you knew I'm Larkin, maybe you can give me some inside opinion, but from my perspective, okay. Yeah. He's clearly (laughs) damaged. He's clearly a, a threat. And and repeatedly in the documentary, in, in the story of these people's lives, they kept associating with them. They brought him in at the castle. And then when he got kicked out of the castle, somebody, uh, I think Lily and her uh, boyfriend, husband, I, I don't know which at the time, brought him into their house rather than learning the lesson like, hey, this guy just got kicked out of another house with some people. Maybe you shouldn't bring him in. Maybe he's a problem. Maybe you got to curate your associations is what I'm talking about. And so and and if you don't, what that leads to is one of the one of the things we saw in the documentary, you have a bad person getting more and more involved and more and more embedded in your circle of friends and toxifying everything and making everything dramatic. And obviously this was an extreme case that escalated to freaking death threats and insanity. And that's not what I'm saying will always happen, but to a lesser degree that will happen with all the bad people that you leave in your orbits. You, yeah. you gotta prune it. Like go. When I say orbits, I mean like I think of I think of myself, not because I'm <laughs> big headed. Just this is an, an, an analogy, okay? I am the center <laughs> of the universe now. And so it's it's just like okay, here I am in the middle, and I have these people that um I want to have around me, and the people that are in the closest orbit to me, I want to be the best, the golden 
examples that are better than me that I can live up to and that set examples for me. And then all the other people get either placed at an outer orbit or out of my solar system on purpose. And man, I come through and I prune that orbit constantly. And that has made my life so peaceful, guys. So uh, there is almost no drama in my life because the moment somebody starts doing some stupid shit or some drama or some fraud or some, you know, just not being a good person that I can look up to, I don't associate with it anymore. I, I, and I, and I don't mean like I, I have a long list of people that I just don't associate with. I don't make a big dramatic, you know, exit. I don't be like, Hey, I'm yeah. disassociating from blah, blah, blah. No, I just, I, I have a, I, I think I'm repeating myself now. I, I prune my orbits and it's so healthy. And that's a lesson that we didn't get from here. So that's the first thing that I think we can take away. And I'll, I'll, I'll let you respond if you have anything to say, and then I'll bring up the next one. Yeah. I was just briefly going to say that. Yeah. That freedom of disassociation is one of the most underused things <laughs> that people in favor of freedom need to focus on. And once upon a time, there was sort of an excuse. Like if there's four voluntarists on the whole planet, you're like, well, I guess we have to put up with them because that's where, well, now there's thousands and thousands and thousands to choose from. If someone's a psycho, don't keep them around in your life just because they call themselves a, a voluntarist or whatever, because that's not going to be good for you. And it's like, when people go, well, let's not be at war with it. Can't we all work together? Well, no, if someone's a toxic psycho, we can't because it's like, well, can't we all work together like us and the rabid tiger in the living room? No, let's remove the rabid tiger from the living room. And then those of us who are like sane and productive can keep trying to do what we do. But it's like people don't know how to disassociate. And they almost think that there's something like, like unanarchistic about it. Like, no, you have to like, be all inclusive. No, I stink and don't. Not when it comes to my life. Like I'm not going to initiate violence against them, but I can sure as hell avoid them if they're psychos. And there's a lot of them. There's the the movement has more than its fair share of freaks and weirdos, as I've said a zillion times, and I've explained why. Um, because and, any and movement. It, yeah, explain why. Because I I think I I drew, I say this all the time, but I think it needs to be reiterated constantly. Go ahead, like. Because any movement that is outside of the mainstream and contrary to the status quo is going to attract people that didn't do well under the status quo. If you're making tons of money and have a nice, comfortable life under however things are, you're not the one who's going to go, hey, something's horribly wrong with this. Like, if you're the one who was born into the royal family and you're a prince and everybody's waiting on your hand and foot, you're probably not the one who's going to go, I think something's bad about this. If you're the guy who's getting like whipped to death for not bowing fast enough for the king, you're probably the one who's going to go, this might be screwed up. So you're going to get people who didn't do well in society as it is, who are first in line to go for any idea, true, false, wise, stupid, whatever, that yeah. is outside of the mainstream. And that's why we have more than our fair share of freaks and weirdos. Incidentally, I consider myself a freak and weird <laughs> for a number of reasons. I'm like asocial and I want people to leave me alone and I'm weird for a number of other reasons. Um, but that's just like, you don't, you don't have to ad adopt freakness and weirdness as part of the philosophy because it has nothing to do with that. It's just, anyway, what's the second thing? The, 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 the way I, the way I say it is like, we are going to attract the damaged people first because the, it's the day yeah. it's the people damaged by the government and this current course of society that are going to see the light and realize the, the nature of the government and the state first. And so we're going yeah. to get the most damaged people first. And that means that we, if we want to lead peaceful lives and set a good example for our ideology, need to be very careful who we associate with. And we need to yeah. disassociate from the bad ones. Like, I, and look, I'm speaking without a lot of context, so I could very much be wrong. But just watching the documentary and only having the knowledge of that, when when this uh, this guy, the the the, the PTSD ex military guy, brought an AT, uh, Bitcoin ATM down, and the Bitcoin ATM got that store like Interpol called on them yeah. because it was a stolen ATM. Right then, that would have been <laughs> the end of my association with that guy. Holy crap. Yeah. This guy is dangerously. He, he's either, I don't, I don't know, manipulative or he's like, um, what's the word I'm looking for? Irresponsible, dangerously irresponsible, bringing yeah. potentially stolen ATMs to, to one of our businesses. So like we got to all I'm saying, 
I'm, I'll stop repeating myself is we got to really watch our associations. The second thing that I caught from the documentary, uh, and it was, it was one of the middle episodes, but it, it applies to what we're talking about too, is the, the, the group of anarchists that were there in Acapulco, uh, had this bad person that was making violent threats. And one of the characters in the documentary, I say characters, what the hell? One of the people <laughs> that exists and is real that I don't know. Yeah. Thank you. Human, uh, said that they don't know how to handle that situation. And they said something to the effect of, I uh, could be misquoting, but we can't call the police because we're anarchists. And I want us to talk about that because I feel like a lot of anarchists might not know how to handle the really bad actors, the violent ones, the criminals that use and run in our circles because disassociating is sometimes not enough. Sometimes you need to protect people from really bad people. So I think it, do you have any thoughts on that? And then maybe I'll give mine. Yeah. As for that uh, particular comment, I have mentioned before that I view the police as rabid dogs, but if there's somebody I would sick a rabid dog on, I wouldn't necessarily mind seeing them. Like if full, it's like, well, I'll send another violent guy after you. If I have two violent psychos duking out. But on top of that, because the police can almost make any situation worse, um, and you don't want them in your proximity. And so um I think there's and this was <clears throat> this was true of the event I was just at. I'm gonna slightly overgeneralize here. There's sort of Generally speaking, the people who came from voluntarism from the political left, the sort of hippie, live and let love, love everybody, free love, you know, all that, whatever, that general category, I know, I know I'm overgeneralizing, tend to be very slow to resort to condemnation and disassociation and even like forcible defense. So there were hundreds of people there. Oh, by the way, when Amanda and I got there, it was really loud and obnoxious and we complained the next morning. We found out that the night before we got there, it was even worse and nobody did anything. Now, the people who came from voluntarism from the political right, which includes me, tend to be the gun owners and the people who understand self-defense and the responsibility of saying, like, if somebody's committing aggression, it's my job just as much as it's anybody else's job to go protect the innocent. And so when you get the ones that are more sort of, well, can't we all just get along and, and love everybody? They're a lot easier victims to psychos and, and aggressors and, and things like that um, because they don't want the job that because it's uncomfortable, not only physically, but psychologically to them to go actually deal with a personal confrontation and say, you're a psycho. I'm not really in a loving mood right now. I'm in a get you the hell out of here mood by any means necessary, because you're literally a threat to people. And they don't like that, which is understandable. Like, I don't, you know, I don't like dealing with that crap myself. But if we're going to be grown-ups and realize, like, we can't wait around for a ruling class, some of us have to have the ability and the willingness to be the ones who at some point are going to say, yeah, if you're actually an aggressor or a threat, we're the ones who are going to make you not be here. And ultimately, if you're like, an imminent threat to, to people's lives will make you not be here by making you not exist anymore. Um, but you know, before that happens, there's lots of in-betweens, but that takes growing up. And I think a lot of people who call themselves anarchists are still, they're still stuck in the escapism. And here, here's one of the main things I'll try to make this quick. Here's one of the main things I wanted to talk about in the video. Doing away with a ruling class doesn't make an awesome society. It just removes the one gigantic thing that makes an awesome society absolutely impossible, which is authoritarian domination. It's like, okay, we're going to remove the gigantic tick and then do stuff. It's not remove the gigantic tick and then sit there. Like, okay, now humanity can do what humanity is supposed to do. Invent things and trade and create and produce and, you know, 80 bazillion positive things. And some people, like especially people traumatized by the state, they're about escapism. I want to go have a rave till four in the morning and fry my brain on meth or whatever until I can't think straight. It's like, okay, you know, 
sorry for whatever trauma you had and to go through that, but a society of you is going to suck because you're not doing anything. You're not producing. You're not of value to anybody else or even to yourself. And just the idea of, well, I want to remove the domination. Good. Then what? Mm. And I think so many people don't even have a then what they don't, they don't know what they would be doing otherwise because they're so focused on, well, let's complain about this injustice, which absolutely should be complained about and done away with. But then what? What do you and, and I don't care what it is. You can be gardening and living in a yurt somewhere or building a castle or working with high tech, you know, whatever it is. But have a positive reason to live, because if we're a community of people whose sole goal is the absence of something and nothing else. It's sort of like, we, it's like, I got to break out of prison. Okay. To do what? I don't know. Sit around like, well, okay. You shouldn't be in prison, but maybe think of something better than sit around if you get out of prison. And that's why I say it's, it's, there really are a whole bunch of statists who absent the crappy belief system they now have. I would much rather be around than a whole lot of people who call themselves anarchists. Um, and I'll say this in case I haven't offended, if, in case there's anybody out there I haven't offended yet. <laughs> I've said this before. We know we're making progress when the normal people start paying attention, and a bunch of them are now. Yeah. Getting the attention of the weirdos is never a challenge. Like, you can go back hundreds of years, and it's like, oh, here's this group of weirdos that thought this weird thing. It's when normal people for example, said, yeah, we think slavery is really bad. Maybe it has to end. Good. Yay. That means society in general is waking up from this lie. And we're starting to see that. But I think there's a bunch of people in the movement who are actually attached to being the weirdos and wouldn't actually want it to become mainstream because then there's nothing special about them. I would love to see this become mainstream where nobody needs to watch my videos, read my books. Cause it's also bleeding obvious and self-evident that who the hell would need to listen to any that garbage. Yeah. I don't want this to be a fringe cool thing that I know that nobody else knows. I want the whole world to go, Oh yeah, that's dumb. Let's stop doing that. Okay. Moving on. Yeah. That that's my dream come true. And I'm not sure that dream is shared by, even half of the, the movement. Yeah. It's, it's part of the damage thing. Like sometimes damaged people are damaged such that they need to be on the outside. They need to be outsiders. They need to be, uh, you know, alone on their hill of whatever. And uh, yeah, th this is going to attract those people for sure. Uh, in the beginning, especially. Uh, so like the point I wanted to make was kind of, I don't want to repeat everything you just said. So I agree. <laughs> Start there. Uh, second would be that, um, just going back to like what to do if you're in one of these violent situations, think through it. Uh, and this gets to a bitch I have with some anarchists while we're doing that. Um, while, we're pitching so, <laughs> while we're pissing everyone off. Uh, so, okay. So the theme come, goes like this. It's like, if you're a real anarchist, you don't have anything to do with the state. You live as if you're already in a free society. You, you know, if there's a violent cartel in the nearby area, you live your life the way you want to live it anyway. And if you don't, you're not being a real anarchist. And if you have a bank account, you're not being a real anarchist. If you use fiat ever, you're not a real anarchist. If you call the cops, you're not a real anarchist. It's like, it's like to be a real anarchist in some of these people's eyes, you have to live with blinders on to the actual world around you. There is an actual government cartel. There's an actual cartel cartel in, in Mexico. Uh, well, I guess here too, right? Everywhere. And, um, and that should factor into the decisions you make for your behavior and what you, how you lead your life and the things you sell, let's say, and, and it's not just. And if you need to use fiat once in a while to live a good, happy life, that doesn't make you less of an anarchist. You're, you're living in the world that you live in. We don't already live in a free society and to not live as if we're already in a free society doesn't make you less of an anarchist. And that goes for when you're dealing with a violent, threatening the lives of innocent people, person, think it through. Okay. What are your options? You can try and take care of the situation yourself and maybe handle the person. If that's what it comes to, let's just say, 
we're on we're stuck on youtube today so i gotta watch out but you know <laughs> like you gotta you can handle the situation yourself and then what's gonna happen well the cartel or the cartel cartel in the area <laughs> sorry the mexican <laughs> government or the cartel whatever will will come and handle you because you're not authorized to handle that situation and so now yeah. you're you're under threat from another from an, from another couple groups of people necessarily so if the person's violent and you are already justified in using force against the person, what it is not unanarchistic to call the cartel that is supposedly trying to protect you to be like, "Hey, we got a violent guy over here. What's the worst that's going to happen? Mm -hmm. Violence, you know." So, um, <laughs> violence to a person that was being violent, like right. I, I, I'm just saying, like there, there's this aversion. Like I, I do not call the cops unless there is a violent situation because that's what the cops bring to the table. Right. So there is a higher yeah. bar there for me, but, um, in general, I, I think people take it too far. They think to be a true anarchist, we have to like cut ourselves off from the world and go live this outsider lifestyle. It's not true. What do you think? Yeah. And it's, I mean, there's a very simple analogy I use all the time that like, if you lived in a city where the, the mafia, the non-government <laughs> mafia was in power, and they say, if you run, they're going to give us extortion fees or we're going to break your kneecaps. Paying off the, the protection racket doesn't mean you approve of it. It doesn't mean you advocate it. It doesn't mean you're cheering for it. It means you're trying to save your own butt. So when people go, well, if you pay taxes or you have a driver's license or whatever, you're not a real anarchist. You're literally just saying to be a real anarchist, you have to make yourself an easier target for thugs of the state. And the thing is, when you don't have that, you're not living more free. You're living more scared because, like I've often said, like I, I carry a firearm to protect me from the private thugs and I carry a dumb little carry permit to protect me from the thugs with badges. Because if I have that dumb little thing, they're less likely to freaking shoot me if they find I'm carrying a firearm. Now I'm in Arizona where you don't need one of them. Yay. Um, but the idea that, uh, that like you shouldn't ever do anything that makes the thugs less likely to attack you, like that doesn't make you more free. It makes you more in danger. And I understand if, if people want to say, I'm, I'm not going along with this and I'm willing to take the risk of not going along with that. Like I, I've done that myself in ways. In some ways I don't do that. I know other people who do that a whole lot. And I know people who do it hardly any all of whom are volunteers because none of them are advocating that, but they're like, well, if there's a thug in the neighborhood who's going to beat the crap out of me, if I behave a certain way, I will change my behavior. Not because I'm obligated to bow to him, but because I don't want him to beat the crap out of me. Mm. Um, and that doesn't mean you're pro authoritarianism and pro thug. It just, it means you're trying to live your life inside a society where there are psychopathic control freaks with badges. And yeah, when people, or like, well, you're not a real anarchist. It, it's like, I think they're among the people who are trying to be super special because we're so different. And where it's not like, okay, and if you, if you want the life where you're that inconvenience, and I know some people like that, and I respect them, where it's like, we live off grid, we don't even have an address, we don't have driver's license, we don't know anything, they don't even know where we are, they can't find us. Like, okay, if that's your choice, outstanding, that doesn't mean you're more of an anarchist. Like, you took away some of your own possibilities because you believe in, like, well, I'm not going along with this. Cool. That's fine. And there's things I wouldn't go along with. Like, it's not a matter of, I will go along with anything government says. It's like, well, I pick and choose. Like, if there's a local thug and he says, you better do this, I choose, well, am I going to do that? Am I going to not do that and be sneaky about it? Am I going to not do that and have a shootout with him? Like, you you choose, but when the other person is the aggressor and you decide to do something that prevents them committing aggression against you, that doesn't, that isn't you condoning the aggression. And it's just, it's kind of sad that, that people need this explained to them. And they think that, well, I'm extra super an anarchist because I inconvenience the crap out of myself and make my life really damn difficult to avoid these things. And it's like, okay, like if you decide that, you decide that. But that's not how logic works. And I'm not saying don't. If that's your thing, if that's yeah. your best life, if that makes you happy, do it, man. Just don't tell yeah. people that you have to to be an anarchist. That's not, 
That is yeah. that is not it at all. Anarchism to be an anarchist is to make a statement about how you want the world to be. Yeah. That's it. That yeah. you, you, as long as you set a good example. And I, I would like to see more of this. People acting instead of bitching. And I say that often, but like to be an set a good example. Be successful. Work hard. Be trustworthy. Have a good reputation. Um you know, it, it, make your word your bond. Make it mean something. If you give your word, do it. Uh, those kinds of things will do more to set a good example to the world about anarcho-capitalism, anarchism, um, than than anything else. I think. Yeah. Okay. I, Go ahead. I will throw in this happy thing. I don't know how close we are to ending our bitchathon here. Uh, I got all <laughs> night, man. No, <laughs> I'm running out of things to bitch about, though. Right. the positive thing i would say about this and and i've been saying this for years when this discussion when this conversation becomes mainstream the state is doomed and i think the hbo special did a lot to make it mainstream now mostly it was about the drama and the story and all that and so that's what a lot of people will focus on the thing is the state cannot afford to have this be a discussion that normal people are exposed to and can talk about and can discuss Mm. and it's getting there. And I've been saying for years and years, like they have to malign us and mischaracterize us and censor us and flip out and, you know, do guilt by association, everything they can think of. Because if normal people can go, huh, you mean like not having a ruling class, the state is screwed because there isn't a rash argument or a moment for the state at all. There never was. So when it when we move from people stuck in their propaganda and they never hear anything else, which that's what I was when I was a statist, to people starting to have the discussion, even if their response is, but what about my roads? Like if the discussion starts in the mainstream, the state is in deep doo-doo. And I think that's happening. And the HBO thing is a fine example of that. And that's why you see governments freaking out and doing these ridiculous, desperate things which are horrible and like hurting much people's lives, but they're also an indication to me that the people in power are just peeing themselves because they realize when it comes to the discussion, they freaking lost. They're trying to resort to resort to brute force because they have no argument. Everybody knows they're crooks, including the people who vote for them left and right. They all know they're all crooks. It's just like, well, my crook isn't quite as bad as your crook. Like they're still stuck in that game. A lot of people, but the number of people now open to the idea and open to the discussion has been skyrocketing and things like the hbo series i think that's that's a plus you know if i was in charge of it it would have been very different and it never would have aired on hbo (laughs) so like that wouldn't have done any good in that setting because it would have been here's an explanation of voluntarism and hbo is not going to run that Examples um, of what you're saying is like when the FBI comes out with a document with the ANCAP flag as a, a violent <laughs> extremist organization. It's like, we're literally just saying you don't ever hurt anyone right. ever unless they attack you first. And that's violent yeah. extremism. Guess who that makes yeah. the bad guy, FBI? Yeah. Come on. <laughs> and, uh, well, it's the old thing. First, first they, what is it? First they ignore you, then they laugh at you, then they fight you, then you win. I know there's mm. 18 different versions of it. And they're to the point of fighting. They can't ignore us anymore. So now they're like, ah, oh, they're terrorists or something. And, you know, constantly using the word anarchist incorrectly in the media and stuff. And and the thing is that I think it's a very good sign that they're this terrified of the discussion that they have to do all this. And whenever the discussion's getting out there, even if it's in the context and in between a, a drama and a sad story and, and stuff going on, it's still getting more and more mainstream. Just the fact that the anarchists appeared on HBO as a thing is going to make some people go, hmm, what's that about? A lot of people will just watch it, and to them it'll be a drama because they don't think about anything anyway. But it being out there at all is huge. And the fact that, you know, uh, like Michael Malice has been on Glenn Beck's show, and like it's, it's sneaking into the mainstream and the mainstream sort of falling apart and then being replaced by something else. Um, but it's like, this is the thing that has to happen. And it's a huge step that this discussion can happen at all. I mean, I'm old and back in my day, you didn't come out and say there shouldn't be a ruling class at all. 
and have anybody agree with you. Just nobody. Like, yeah, there were some three or four fringe weirdos going back centuries saying that, but all the proper civilized, wise and educated people would never for a moment have that discussion, and now they are. Um, and it's funny because there's a number of people um, that I think about a, a bunch of anarchists would actually be surprised how many pretty to do and well off people are now having the discussion. And I know some of them, and I can't say who they are, who are saying, yeah, I can't come out and say what I believe, but I do want to help out. Um, and in other words, we have a bunch of allies that that people haven't heard of and that don't dare to come out yet, but it isn't that it's the whole world against us anymore. So many people are so sick of this crap that they're actually ready for the conversation. And even if it happens in random ways and random places, like in the HBO thing, I still think that is a massive step forward. Like what has, you know, the creature from Jekyll Island has voluntarism ever been stated on HBO Has any of those principles ever showed up in a show that big. Not that I know of. And that's a right. good thing, even if I would have rather it have, you know, come across 15 different ways. And the fruit is hanging lower every day. Like when I put, even yep. for a second, I put my old Republican blinders back on. And I think like I used to think. And, <laughs> and um, it, it, had I been around today and watched cops sit outside of a school while kids got murdered, and then two <sighs> weeks later or something, three weeks later, the FBI raids the president's house and takes his passports. <laughs> And, and you know my faith in the justice system and law and order is at an all-time low i'm starting to actually see the cracks in the government's you know just authority man yeah like it there's low-hanging fruit out there you just gotta like yeah. like we said set a good example for people when they see you and they see you saying well the government has no just authority they're terrible at everything look at those cops hiding outside that school look at the fbi being politicized into raiding their political enemies like you all you just just point out you just point to the cracks and the low-hanging yeah. fruit will drop in your lap but if you're out there you know being an edge lord and blasting your music and just being a dick and then using the labels that we're fighting for i want those people to be disassociated from because i mean yeah. that's the that's what needs to happen to to curate our movement so to speak well yeah Okay, so the, I wanted to kind of end our talk on a positive note and then maybe uh, take the viewer questions. So last call for viewer questions. Uh, if you have questions, ca put question in all caps in the chat, and so I'll, hopefully I'll see it. It's been a lot of chatter. I appreciate you guys engaging. You guys are awesome. Uh, okay, so positive note. The documentary, because it followed Nathan, and, and again, never met him, don't know him. Um, he was definitely jilted. Don't know why necessarily don't know what happened with him in an Arcapoco, but he was definitely jilted and he was definitely upset uh, when he was disassociated from when it comes to the event. And so the documentary really put like a negative spin on the event, but I was there those two years and I had a blast. I thought the events were mm -hmm. great. And the, the documentary kind of made it seem like the event was falling apart and had low attendance and it was terrible and controversial. And there was all this drama guys. I was there and I was hardly aware of any of this and I had a great time. Uh, so just keep in mind, like there's over a thousand people at these events and, you know, five of them are having issues and the documentary <laughs> is focusing on them. So just let's try and keep perspective. The events were fun. Um, I haven't, I, I haven't been in attendance the last two years because of COVID they've been doing this, uh, decentralized thing. Um, and because of COVID and the medical tyranny that's been happening around the world, they've been really focused on the the medical advice and the medicine stuff, which I'm not terribly interested in. And that's fine. Um, and I'm, and I'm hoping this year they're going to bring it back and kind of what I loved about an Arcapoco was, and there's no other ideology really like this is that you get all these different types of people, just wildly different types of people, uh, yeah. that I would never, that, that would never associate with each other in real life ever, uh, in any mm -hmm. other context other than, anarchy embracing freedom they all come together yeah. at an archipelago you got the nerd you got the philosophy nerds like me you got the entrepreneurs you got the cryptocurrency uh business savvy uh i don't know stock trader types you got the the crystal sniffing hippies or you know whatever i love you guys and uh <laughs> and the chakra lighting people and the and the uh alternative medicine whatever people and and um they all come together 
And it's sort of like they're all family for a week. Wow. That literally never happens anywhere. Anywhere yeah. in the history of the species, maybe. It's magical. <laughs> Uh, yeah. and it's crazy and, and it's awesome. Um, so it's a good event. What do you think? Yeah. In fact, uh, Amanda and I are planning to be back there in February. We haven't awesome. been there for a few years, but we're planning to be back. Yeah. And it's uh, the, like the, the one principle you have to have in common is so freaking simple. And it's, it's kind of <laughs> sad that it, takes that much effort to get people to realize, you know, how to have peaceful coexistence, which is don't have authority. Let (laughs) let everybody be in freedom. But when they get that and people realize it, it's really dang empowering. Um, And that's for everybody. And that's, you know, to me, that's one of the reasons to not corrupt the message with a whole bunch of things and realize you can be any of those things and still say, I want to leave other people in freedom. And that's yeah. the only thing we need to have in common to have peaceful coexistence on the whole stinking planet. Um, and I'm actually planning a thing called, um, why can't we all just get along? I was actually going to record it earlier. Um, it may be like a seminar thing to explain to the world. They're like, sort of gently introduce them to the fact that the reason we can't is because your belief system sucks, <laughs> but it's not because you're bad. Because when people give it up, they don't give up their values. They don't give up their preferences. They don't. All they give up is, oh yeah, let's not ask that big monster to to violate other people. The end. <laughs> like that's all we have to have in common to get along. You're nailing it, man. You yeah, exactly. Like I don't have to think it's wise to try and cure cancer with vitamin C to want you to be left alone and sovereign. And to respect your property and to be against anybody that would try and control you. And yep. you, these people don't have to think, I don't know. What do I do? Like, I, I don't think, uh, constellations are real. And you know, the, the, what is it? The, um, um, the astrological signs or whatever. I, I don't think that's real. Oh, okay. And these people would say the same thing. They'd be like, well, Patrick is probably dumb. He doesn't believe in astrology, but that's okay. I want to defend Patrick's right, you know, to, to be left alone. That's what yep. brings it all together. And that's what's so unique about this ideology, whatever it's called, this movement. I, again, I hate these words, but yeah. Yeah. Uh, it's it's the most individualist collective possible. I yeah. like that. <laughs> yep. yep. I'm trademarking it. Yeah. Of course, intellectual property doesn't exist. Okay. So <laughs> I'm um, going to sue you. <laughs> oh, okay. Uh, okay. So let's do, do you have any final thoughts? And uh, Otherwise, we'll get to some questions. We can dive into questions. I'm here melting in Phoenix because it's 100,000 degrees. <laughs> one, of, one of my air conditioning units is out of my house right now, so I feel you. I feel <laughs> you. You know what? I, I don't know why it's so freaking hard to find an AC repairman that understood, understands the two magic words, cash price and cryptocurrency, but it is impossible. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. <laughs> uh, so if you know anybody. Uh, okay. So, uh, okay. Viewer questions. Here we go. Christian asks, what... If anything, do you think could be a positive outcome from the series as a whole? I'm pretty sure the default would be exposure or something, but maybe there's a creative upside I haven't thought of. What do you think? Um, in addition to just some of the people going, hey, that sounds interesting and looking out, it may be a tiny percentage of the viewers. It's a huge number of viewers, so that's good. Um, I would love to see if there's a, a, another season of it, if Kim and Todd are, are invited to keep going with it. I have no idea if that's going to happen. Um, I think they would be interested if there was such a thing. Uh, hopefully yep. it'll be less dramatic and more substance. Um, but anything that continues. The, and then the HBO won't buy it. Well, you can have other exciting things happen that are less depressing and whatever. Um, but yeah, they'll tell the, matter. they'll tell the story of Larkin confronting the loud music players at the event. That will be, <laughs> Some serious drama. I wish I could have seen that. Uh, yeah. Oh, good Lord. <laughs> oh, man. So, yeah, the, uh, Kim and Todd, I think you're watching. Uh, I'm in touch with you. You know you have an open invitation. You're welcome on the show, and we can talk about um, all of this stuff. And if you're going to make more, you're welcome on. Come on anytime. Okay, next question. Uh, A-T-B-A-F-E says, it was clear the tone for the series was set in the first episode. Would you agree? Um, for me? No, I think the first episode felt different than 
all of the others. Any any opinion yeah, on that? It felt, it felt like the most philosophical explanation was in the first one, and then the rest was heavily about the, the drama and the goings-on. Um, I mean, they were consistent, but the first one was more sort of laying the groundwork of well, what's this about. Pork, I see your question. I don't know what that means. Maybe restate it in different language, and I'll, I'll try and ask that question. Uh, Christian asks, uh, if you were to do a series like The Anarchists, if you were to do a series like The Anarchists, a character-driven drama that HBO would actually buy, what would you do differently and why? That is a fucking SAT question. That's great. Um, I wouldn't, because I wouldn't do it as well as... <laughs> and Kim do because I don't know what the hell I'm doing. Um, what I would do differently, I don't know, because they covered that story really dang well. Like, I mean, because I'm me, I would, like, try to get more of the ideas focused on, and, like, the more I did that, the less likely HBO would be <laughs> interested in airing the thing. But, I mean, obviously, that would be my bias, is trying to get, you know, those ideas out as much as possible. Um but as for the reporting of events, like, I don't really know that there's anything I would do different if my job was, if I was actually neutral and my job was here, report the drama and the stuff, that things that people would actually watch. I, not only could I not do better, I couldn't do that well. I couldn't nearly do as well as they did. Freelance asks, how was Jeff Berwick's performance in the documentary? I don't really know what you mean by that question. Um, he was interviewed, answered a bunch of questions. <laughs> I don't know how, how yeah, to answer that. I one. mean, uh, I, I like that, you know, it's always, you're getting the philosophy in little tidbits here and there in the midst of a story rather than, okay, here's a you know three hour explanation of voluntarism. Um, but I think a lot of the clips are from him are really good. And from a lot of people, but from him are really good where he simply and succinctly like explains bits and pieces um for people like and and you know i know kim and todd had 80 bazillion hours of stuff to go through and edit into a coherent story which holy crap i would not want that job just going through that much stuff um, oh man editing that four minute intro was such a beating like i would not want to do a six hours of documentary which by the so, way if you're if you're over here from odyssey and you missed the intro because of those technical difficulties you should definitely watch the beginning of the stream it was a fun intro yeah <laughs> Okay, uh, let's see. Strategic Tactic asks, were y'all wanting a bit more of the philosophy and reasoning that people were using behind decisions rather than their actions? Look, like, from my perspective, they told a story about some, some crazy shit that actually happened, and they did a damn good job as documentarians telling that story. I had a couple complaints for sure with the name of the series and the directly associating those actions and those bad decisions with an ideology. Yeah. What do you think? Yeah. And the thing is, it was sort of, you know, it was anarchists muddling that anyway. It wasn't, it wasn't like the, the people who produced it had to go out of their way to muddle it. It was anarchists make muddling the distinction between, you know, here's some sad and dramatic and, you know, drama stuff that happened and therefore something about anarchism. It's like, no, therefore something about humanity, which is completely aside from the actual principles involved. And that's, you know, what, what there was that was sort of muddled. There was just people being muddled in their heads and therefore muddled in their communications. Clarity of thought leads to clarity of language. Yeah. So. And I'm talking, and like, this is super weird, right? Cause like you don't usually see a documentary about people that, you know, or people that are in your, circles yeah. but like if any of the people that were in the documentary are hearing the things i'm saying and disagree or have opinions i'm always up for a good conversation so just let me know we can talk through it and I'm, i could be wrong i don't know like who knows fringe recall asks uh larkin how the hell do we teach people to be logical instead of airing their dirty laundry and drama like it's public discourse that is a good question go ahead larkin what do you think <sighs> well <laughs> i hate to say it but my answer is we don't we, we basically have to teach the principles and expect a lot of people to be that way because that's how people are. Um, I think the best we can do is make sure we are clear in the distinction between people drama stuff 
and the actual ideas because they're not like they're not they're independent of each other. Um, hopefully, the ideas affect how people behave. Um, but when they don't, it's not the idea's fault. It's like, oh, he was an anarchist and he went and killed and ate his neighbors. It's like, yeah, that's not in line with voluntarism. So don't blame voluntarism if that happens. Um, so yeah, pe- people are going to be people. And again, I've been complaining about this for 26 freaking years. It's why I've, I never all the way associate myself with any organization, with any event. It's like, I will ally myself with this as long as I think it's on a road that's, you know, some path that I think is useful and I can, you know, try to get the word out by way of it. And the moment it veers off, I'm like, okay, well then I'm going to go somewhere else. Um, because it's not about alliances and all that crap. It's about ideas. The message will outlive all of the messengers, including all of us. And to me, that's what matters. And my only, the only thing I'm jealous of is trying to keep the message clear. So when drama stomps on it, I try to like hurl the drama off and go, okay, sad or happy or dumb or whatever. Here's what the ideas still are, regardless of what people do when they're just being people. I, yes. Um, I, my advice is again, is just set a good example. Like if, uh, if you're out there being your best self and not airing your dirty laundry and not being a drama queen and not getting in other people's business and spreading gossip, uh, then that's, that's what we need. We need more people doing that instead of being the drama queens that spread the gossip and cause the controversy and blast their music. Apparently, uh, <laughs> so, yeah, just be the best person you can be the best representative of, um, freedom and liberty and anarchy as you can question for Mark Maresca. Good to see you, Mark. Uh, number one, maybe their grasp of anarchy was only intuitive sensing the validity of freedom, but not well versed in it. They assumed it's enough to get together with the like-minded and life will be peachy Two. When things did not work out, they blamed the philosophy, understandable and even logical from their narrow point of view. Yeah, that. <laughs> I don't know that there's anything to add to it. It's very well said. Yeah, if, if people are just sort of, well, I sort of have this feels thing and then something went wrong. It's like, well, if, if you don't intellectually understand the principles, then you might blame the philosophy for, you know, drama and stuff when it had nothing to do with that but that's a different thing. That's yeah. An addendum to the last one. Like part of being setting a good example is disassociating from those people, the drama Queens, the gossip, the, the, the sources of conflict and, and nonsense and gossip and all that stuff. Don't hang out with those people. Elevate yourself, elevate your orbits. It's good stuff, man. you you will, I swear your life will be so much more calm and peaceful. Oh, it's good. Um, Barking Bandicoot asks, did the camp conference not have an organizer to contact regarding the noise? Was what, what event was this? Or do you not want to say? I'm trying not to say, and I'm trying not to name names. That's fine. Okay. The the person who designated themselves as organizer is the one who made it happen. (laughs) That's (laughs) so again, (laughs) a little bit mixed about it. Yeah. So, I mean, it's a good question if, as long as, so we can back up from the specific example and be like, how should that be handled amongst free individuals? And my answer would be who owns the property the event is on easy peasy. The problem always comes in when you're having property, when you're having events on like public property or public land, where there is no final arbiter of what is and isn't allowed. Um, and that's the state of existence for a lot of events right now. What do you think? And there was no final arbiter because of the particular place it happened, which is a convoluted, weird thing, um, which made it a a way worse problem. Um, The thing was, if you know damn well, here's a place where a bunch of people are are camping out and like, don't inflict your crap on them. (laughs) Like, it's not yours either. It's the tragedy of the commons thing. I was even going to do a thing about that. It was like, well, what do you do if it's nobody's? Because that makes a mess. Um, but yeah, in this case, it, there wasn't somebody to just say, this is my property, shut up or get off, or we're going to have really loud music. If you don't like it, go somewhere else. Cause you can do that too. On private property. <sighs> Mark, Mark asks, do you know if the producers consider themselves anarchists? I believe so. Um, I think Todd said he doesn't label himself as that. I don't want to speak for him, but come on, Todd, I mean, come on the show. Tell us. But yeah, it, ask it's the Todd. first question I have to ask you when you come on the show. That's like tradition. Yeah. Um, but more or less, I mean, they're very, very, very sympathetic with it. 
whether you know whether they want to wear that label um i don't know and i mean that that's a whole other thing of whether to wear the label to avoid the guilt by association thing or whether to say well this is what i actually means i'm wearing the label because that's what i am like if i oppose the existence of a ruling class i'm an anarchist whether i want to use that word or not i still am um and i understand some people are like well it's that's so corrupted i don't want to use that label okay well that then it's like about psychology and impression and propaganda and stuff like that um but they are very very sympathetic um with the concepts of self-ownership and stuff because we know them we know that amanda and i know kim and todd um, another friends one. of ours and some people awesome i look forward to, i hope i get to speak to them uh mark uh another question for mark speaking of michael malice any idea why his name was in the credits i caught that too i have no i have no idea <laughs> Yeah, uh, from what I heard, again, you can ask Kim and Todd for more details. Um, they did an interview with him, but because his, his sort of rise to fame happened after most of this happened, he wasn't exactly relevant to the goings-on that were in the story. Um, but I think they did interview him, and in the editing phase, they were like, yeah, but he wasn't there. So it's sort of like he doesn't have commentary about what was going on because he wasn't there. And so I think it was like, uh, I think they were sort of bummed that there wasn't a way to fit it in there and have it be, have it make any sense. Cause he wasn't like at that time he wasn't there. So I think that's, I think that's why like they did an interview and it's why it just sort of didn't make the cut because he wasn't at the event. Paul, the mall cop question mark asks <laughs> Larkin. <laughs> Larkin thoughts on the Mises caucus. I'm real. Oh, this is not really related to the topic today. Um, r really quickly. Do you have any thoughts on the Mises caucus? Um, I'll complain about them later. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> That's all I'll say now. I mean, I like the intentions of some of them. I think the approach is not really going to help that much. <laughs> Uh, I like the change in messaging that we've seen out of the Libertarian Party over the past several months. It's been amazing. Um, the Mises Caucus plays politics just like all the rest. Uh, so that's my opinion. And my that's my direct experience when I ran for not governor of Texas, at least. So, yeah. Ask us later or join our Discord server and we can discuss yeah. all, all you want about it. Discord.me slash Discord for the join link for our Discord server. Uh, Mike Bastiat asks, sure, paying taxes doesn't make you any less anarchist, but isn't resistance required at some point to ever change society? Tax result, uh, tax revolts, refusing to get licenses, etc. Um, sort of and sort of not like if enough people understood the concepts of self-ownership and that authorities bogus, we literally all look around and go, okay, do we all just stop now? Yeah. Okay. And there's nothing they can do because we outnumber them a gazillion to one. Um, I don't think statism is going to crash and burn in a glorious revolution. It's going to sort of fizzle out and die as enough people just say, well, we're going to quietly do things under the table and eventually the state will just be whining in a corner. Hey, you're all supposed to give us money and nobody will be doing it and yeah. it won't stink and matter. Um, uh, that's not to say I'm against people who openly say, I'm not going to do this. Like, I'm not going to give you money. I'm not going to turn in my guns, you know, whatever it is that's totally principled and it's, it's somebody's choice when to put themselves at risk by doing that. Um, but in the end, I don't think it's a glorious battle. It's literally people growing up and stepping away from the stupidity and just letting it go, you know, like the Soviet union didn't fall in a grand revolution. It was just one day the news said, Oh, by the way, that big thing over there is not there anymore. <laughs> and I think the U S empire is going to do the same thing. Like nobody gives a crap about them anymore. Nobody's obeying them. Nobody's paying tribute to them. So we're just going to stop pretending they have power. Yeah. I'm um, same. I, th I think it, it, there's no positive obligation to resist. It's based on your personal cost benefit analysis. Like Larkin just said, I would, I would call the people that do resist heroic in a lot of ways, like uh, Ross Elbricht creating the, the, the first time in the history of the world, this massive uh, free market, for goods that are banned by all these countries that was heroic he's paying for it mm -hmm. he's a hero in a lot of ways yeah. uh so people like that that put their life on the line for the cause of like freedom man heroes obligated to no um yeah. last question i think yes uh liberty after dark asks would you prefer there be more shows like the anarchists or assuming that your criticism couldn't be addressed 
or would you rather not see another? That's I'd rather see final more question. Like, really? Yeah. The more the conversation shows up, the better. Even if it's like only a few people are noticing the, the principles behind all the noise and the drama, it's still at least a possibility for people to go, well, I kind of agree with them on that. And then they follow the story and whatever, because planting the little seeds you know, in people's heads who've never heard these things. I guarantee a lot of people watch the HBO thing, and especially in the first episode, thought, oh, yeah, I don't really disagree with that. And then they followed the drama. And that's, even if it's not a philosophy for them yet, it's not even, they haven't even thought about it that much yet. The more people hear it, the more they're capable of considering it. So, yeah, if there were a hundred more you know, just like it with all my same complaints about the drama and people doing a bad job of representing, I would still rather have that than not. <laughs> Do we disagree? We find something to disagree on? Oh, man. We, uh, you might have changed my mind just now, like as you said that. <laughs> like, I, I, Come on, I was, disagree. Just for the I was not feeling it, man. Like, it, just because of the association with the, the ideology followed by a bunch of dumpster fire is is going to solidify so like that low hanging fruit i was talking about the the people that are just starting to question authority and see the conflict of interest in government and the lack of just authority and then they watch this and they're like okay well the alternative is no government and that went terribly even by the end of that episode these anarchists that had lived that way realized that it was the wrong way to go and you know we're talking about their ideology falling apart around them and and uh, ex anarchist, that one dude was labeled on screen, you know, ex anarchist. Former uh, anarchist. Yeah. Form, former anarchist, yeah. It's like you're just reinforcing to this low hanging fruit. You're, you're lifting the fruit higher up. You're, these people are now going back, okay, well, well I got to fix the system because the alternative is fucking <laughs> chaos. See? See? Here's the chaos. What, you know, when people try and live out the government, they can't even take care of an obviously violent threat in their midst. We need government. And so rather than taking that final red pill, so to speak, they're going to go right back in and be like, well, yeah, the FBI might have raided Trump, but you know, uh, I guess we'll just try and abolish the FBI and replace it with some other goddamn dumpster fire. Yes. I'm, I'm pessimistic. Would I want another one just like this? Ah, like, no, I don't not just like this, Ah, but you have some good points. So it would the be more people be talk omniscient. about it, it would be glad to be on this magically be able to know like how many people's minds were changed in, in one direction or another, or just they're starting to think about it or cause I actually think the number of people who would have gone voluntarist, but didn't because of this is probably zero. <laughs> like it may confirm some people's bias. This is why we need government, but they were going to think that anyway. Um, I You're don't right. think it's going to dissuade very many people who actually understand the principles or paying any attention so but yeah, you know yeah, i don't yeah. know i have to talk to seven billion people to find out that's why i said you changed my mind I, like at the end of the day you're right the more conversations that this has that, that are have i can't even talk anymore the more times this conversation happens the more people will be convinced on the edges of that conversation and that's a good thing and the yeah. damage that is caused by running the the word anarchist through the mud is minimal because it's already been destroyed by the commies. So, um, yeah. <laughs> yes, I agree. You have changed my mind. All right. Well, guys, thanks for uh, watching and hanging out in the comments. Those really good questions. Larkin, thanks for hanging out again and going through all this. You're welcome to chat anytime. Um, yeah. Anytime. Any, any yeah. final thoughts? Well, I'm just going to beat this dead horse again. I've been doing this for 26 freaking years. 10 years ago, I never would have dreamed that a huge series on HBO would actually talk about the issue at all, you know, and the drama and stuff that may muddy it, may confuse people and stuff like to have to have come this far where I know thousands and thousands and thousands of people who identify as voluntarists and now it's being talked about on hbo 10 15 years ago i never would have believed that was going to happen in my lifetime so yeah it didn't the hbo series didn't fix the world <laughs> like did anybody think it was gonna um but it's still you know if it isn't a cause of something good it is a symptom of something good which is 
these ideas aren't under wraps anymore. They're not silenced anymore. They're coming out all over the place, and that's going to keep happening. And the more it happens, the better, until the whole world figures out, yeah, let's stop doing this one really dumb thing, and then we can do 8 million different positive, peaceful things and, you know, have actual humanity start. Somebody just told me that I missed some questions. Um, one oh, yeah. sec. Let me just make sure. Sorry, Larkin. Let me just give me one second. That's good. I would feel terrible. Talk amongst yourselves. <laughs> yeah, we've had, we've had I some. I probably have another five minutes before I die of heat exhaustion, so we're good. <laughs> uh, no, I, I, I can't access them right no, now. So sorry, sorry, guys. We've had some weird technical issues today with Odyssey and, and uh, Float. So. Sorry. Yeah. All right. Yeah. I'll, I'll leave it there with Larkin's words. Thanks everybody. Uh, man, it's been a wild ride and imagine where we're going to be in 10 years. Like what the hell happens 10 years from now post FBI rating Trump and all this insanity that happened. Like it's, <sighs> we might need to have another show Larkin where we talk about what the <laughs> hell is happening. All right. <laughs> yep. Thanks for watching everybody. Peace, love and anarchy.